Shalom and welcome to the Arugot Farm. Uh, this is a special uh, release right now. We, this is uh, wartime. And uh, I was not re even really up for doing this. That's the truth. But Jeremy uh, said, you know, I know that we have a, you said we have a burden on our shoulders. We have to protect, we have to patrol, we have to do all these things. And I'm, I feel like I'm so caught up in getting the supplies, preparing ourselves for whatever may happen, doing the patrols and the guard duty, everything while we're preparing. And I'm like, well, we're going to start making content now. And you said, yes, that's exactly the case. I think we need to make content and, uh, and project a certain message to the world, the truth of what's happening, what we're going through here. And uh, I agree. I agree. And so here we are. We are in our Beit Knesset, our house of prayer, our synagogue here on the top of the mountain in the Arugot farm. It has turned into uh, sort of an army barracks. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to be very careful not to release too much information, too many details, but I feel um, like we are doing a good job uh, securing and fortifying this place. And so we have uh, reservists that are here and they are, you know, sleeping here, guarding here. This is one of the bases at the farm, uh, one of the different bases that we have that uh, security is centralized, uh, centered around. Um, so here we are, and we're at war, and we're at a special place in history right now. And uh, I have what to say, I have a lot on my mind, but I want to hear from you first, Jeremy. This was your idea. <laughs> so this is, uh, the ball's in your court. So let's hear, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, hard times, hard times. I have like a lot of thoughts that are sort of jumbled around, but I just felt like it's our responsibility to allow people to just hear the true story, hear what's happening, connect to us, to this place, to the families that are going through all of this. Um, you know, Chazal say, the sages of Israel say, they would rather die than to be alive in the times when Mashiach comes. They said the atrocities that will be witnessed will be so horrific that they would just rather not be around to see it. And the last few days, as more and more stories are coming out of what the Hamas did over the holiday when they just invaded into Israel, it's as if the devil was unleashed on the world and evil was exposed in the most horrific way possible. You know, people kill and talking about Nazis and the comparisons. Um, Nazis put us in gas chambers and we're a little bit more removed from it. What the Arabs have done here to the Jewish people, it was almost like a sadistic love of getting their hands in the blood. There were Nazis like that too, let's not fool ourselves. The, it's the same, it's the same. It's the same sadism and evil and glee in the murder of babies and children and the desecration of everything that is light and good and holy. And you know, the, the, I've heard the thing before, this is worse than the Nazis. Okay, let's not get lost in that. They're, they're worse than the Nazis, the same as the Nazis. This is evil that we're looking at straight in the eye. Well, I think that that's really the most important part of it because people want to ignore the evil. They want to deny that evil exists. Justify it. They want to justify the evil. They just sort of want to, you know, not deal with that reality. And Israel's mandate is to bring light to darkness, to vanquish the evil, not to ignore it, not to put it behind a fence, not to pretend that it doesn't exist. And if we don't vanquish the evil, the evil will eventually attack us. Evil attacks the Jew first. We saw it with the Nazis. Immediately as Hitler rose to power, it started systematically annihilating the Jewish people. And then what happened? Pearl Harbor happened eventually. Evil will want to take over the entire world. And right now the Hamas are calling to wage war against all non-Muslims in Western countries. In the United States, there are Hamas cells. They're being now activated. They're being called to action. Evil wants to dominate. And if you just ignore it, it eventually will rise up. And now we have to confront it. And the question is now, will we vanquish it? Because that's what is being called on us. And you know, there's always these verses in the Bible, in the Torah, that we were always a little bit uncomfortable with. What, Amalek, we have to, we have to wipe them all out? All of them? Also the women, also the children, just all of them? And when you see Amalek manifest, when you see absolute evil manifest, now we know, yes, exactly, that's what the Torah was pointing us to, to not allow our soldiers to tiptoe through the alleyways of Aza in order to make sure that the civilians that elected the Hamas, support the Hamas, parade our dead bodies through their streets, cheering for Jewish death, yes, they're not to be spared. What's happening now is interesting. Well, I just want to tell you, the, the, I don't think that there's anyone that I've spoken to that hasn't said that they are already 
traumatized severely just from the videos that they saw. Even if you try not to watch the videos, you can't help but to see the videos because the, that was, by the way, it's not just some Hamas guy that's like, oh, this is fun, I gotta record this. That is part of their mission was to record it and to broadcast it out with the goal of striking fear and horror and traumatizing the entire world of the power of jihad and Allah. And by the way, this whole Allah thing, let's talk about that soon. Because if they're saying Allah Akbar, a lot of times I've heard people say, oh, you know, I'm the God of Israel and Allah, it's all the same God. If it's going through a prism of such twisted, distorted darkness and evil, how is that the same God? But that's another discussion to be had. But the, 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 the videos that we're seeing, you, you just said like the children, like I, I just have these videos of this little Israeli boy surrounded by Hamas kids and adults and they're beating him and laughing at him and poking him and just the desecration of God's name and the human, this little boy, I just so badly wanted to shield him, wrap around him and take it all for him. It's so horrific. But anyway, go ahead, Jeremy. Well, I mean, we're just being confronted with evil now. And so what will the people of good do? And so... Um, we're in a unique time because I think most people are wondering like, well, why isn't Israel striking back? What's happening? And so if you look back in history in the Six Day War, um, Nazar of Egypt closed the Straits of Tehran and that was an act of war. And then they started amassing troops on the borders. And then there was three weeks of kind of almost like the quiet before the storm. And that's what's happening right now in Israel. The entire IDF has been enlisted and now they are sitting and they're preparing. Israel is a little bit like a wounded lion right now that is crouching and slowly, slowly getting close to pouncing. But these are the sort of the times in between where we really need to strengthen ourselves. And the one, um, I guess, light of hope that I see on the horizon is that Israel is unifying in a way that I've never seen before. Jews from around the world that have been so removed from Israel for so many years. It was almost like they didn't ever really want to deal with Israel. They sort of wanted to hide their Jewish identity. Let's, I don't even want to get into that conversation. All of a sudden, all of their resources, all of their support is coming to Israel. People from around the world are coming together now. Well, just, can I just touch on that one point about Jews around the world, Jews in Israel? You're right, and I see it and it's beautiful, and there's times that I see people, you know, I, I know certain individuals, let's say on Facebook, that were pro-Biden, you know, that were for the disengagement from Gaza, for all of the things that led to this, and now they're like, my heart stands with Israel, I can't sleep at night, and I want to have a reaction and say to them, you empowered our enemies to let this happen, but why? What's that going to do? Yes. I don't say it, it's not going to do anything, but... There are Jews for the justice of Palestine that are signing things saying, no, 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 signing a petition saying uh, Israel should not go in and Israel is at fault and it's the occupation that led to this. There are fringe, but this is what it is. It's a time of refinement. And those Jews that are so sick, twisted, and distorted that they've been taken over by that darkness, I think it's a small fringe. Well, I want but you to imagine what happened. We had to deal with the Hamas. The Hamas haven't changed. And so instead of dealing with them, we disengaged from them, which was a mistake, obviously. And then we had to protect our borders because they kept on digging tunnels. They kept on shooting rockets. So then we developed Iron Dome. And then when they come out of Gaza and they pillage our villages and rape our women and kill our children, and then they're like, they wonder, well, why, why, did you, why were they behind that security wall? And it's like, we left all of Gaza in so much support. They could have turned Gaza into Singapore. They could have made it the most beautiful place in the world, but instead they used all of that money, all of the U.S. tax dollars, all of the European Union tax dollars to buy weapons, to dig tunnels, to buy rockets, because they are single-mindedly focused on killing Jews. And I'll tell you, there are Jews here that I, you know, you know them, I know them, they're friends of ours, they're neighbors of ours, and Jews have, I think, a very high level of tolerance for disagreement, even on fundamental issues, where we're able to sit around and be really good friends, and even enjoy the debates and the discussions, but there are Jews, even here in Judea, that are always, like, trying to do the uh, coexistence and dialogue and discussion with the jihadists. And you know, there was one that I was talking to and, and she was saying, the reason that they were, this is before the war, the, the throwing of the rocks and the uh, periodic attacks is because they're hopeless. They have no hope. And we see here that no, no, these attacks is because they have hope. Their hope is to wipe Israel off the map. It's not because they're under the occupation and they don't get their democratic. It's such a projection of westernized values on jihadists that are living in a different era. 
and a different place altogether and saying, well, that's how I would feel in that situation, so that's how they're feeling. And it's so ridiculously obvious that this isn't about hopelessness, it's about hope, which is why I really feel like there's already been a failure. It's already been a failure. After this attack, we should have immediately, the minute I heard uh, Netanyahu say, we're gonna make them, uh, already the game is lost. I don't wanna hear a word. I wanna see action. I wanna see napalm. I want to see napalm. I want to see absolute obliteration to the degree where they're like, whoa, we crossed a line here. These Jews mean business because we're seeing it. If uh, we're, sh we're still shooting in the air and we're still dropping the bombs to knock on the ceilings and we're still giving the terrorists time to flee, then they're seeing, okay, well, clearly the, uh, the, they're terrified and they have hope. Well, I think and that hope is, is what's going to cause more and more and more attacks. Well, I think what's happening right now is that Israel is taking its time. It's now putting a siege on Gaza to take away all of their electricity, to take away their fuel. A siege is meant to weaken the enemy. And it's also giving time for non-Hamas supporters to leave Gaza. And if you saw the videos, there are hundreds of thousands of Gazans that are now at the Egyptian border crossing over. Many of them probably Hamas. And so, but right now, anyone that stays in Gaza is actively supporting the Hamas. The Hamas are saying, stay. And those that are listening to the Hamas are loyal to the Hamas, and they are Hamas supporters. Those that are fleeing, we've given them ample time now. And so now we need to pressure all of those Gazans, as many as possible, to get out, conquer Gaza entirely, restore order, and that's what needs to be done. All of those that leave the Hamas, they, they're all now in Egypt, and we will find a solution for them after the war. The world will help rebuild. Anyone that stays in Gaza, in Hebrew you would say, damam berosham, their blood is on their own hands for staying and siding with the Hamas in this battle. And then they just need to be pushed out, and Gaza needs to be entirely conquered again. It's like, take back Gaza now. That's what needs to happen. Okay. And so... Um, there's a few things that I, I'm seeing that are happening because everything that happens in Israel is happening with some divine intervention. There's a process that's happening. And, you know, the Nevoah says, the prophecy says, achishena, that it's going to come in its time, I will hasten it. And then they ask, I mean, what does Isaiah mean? Seems like a paradox. The paradox, in its time, I will hasten it. Either there's a, a, a time that it's going to happen, or God is going to hasten it before there's a certain time. How can it be in its time, I will hasten it? And Chazal say like this, the interpretation of that prophecy in Isaiah of the end of days says, well, if we merit and we do what's right, then it will happen and God will hasten the coming of Mashiach, will bring world peace, but if not, if we are not able to do what needs to be done, it's going to come upon us now. We will be forced to become who we need to become, whether we want to or not. If we're not able to on our own, then the disastrous circumstances will fall upon Israel in order to create Israel to be who we were created to be. And so now, here's an example all of the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Haredim that are around Israel. So there's been a, I don't know, 75-year battle about should they serve in the army, shouldn't they serve in the army. It's created a lot of like bad feelings, it seems unfair, it seems imbalanced. All military-aged men now are being emergency enlisted into the army, including the Haredim. They're going to be going through a short, quick training and they're gonna do whatever they need to do. Maybe they won't be on the front lines of combat units yet, but they will all be serving the country in the IDF right now. And you know what, I think that even them, because there's a certain luxury, I've always felt this luxury that they've had that I'm happy that they've had, which is like, we're not in there, we're against the soldiers, we're against, but I think they recognize right now, everyone that's in the land recognizes, because we, uh, we've seen the chink in our armor, the, disil the illusion, of the power of the Israeli army, the omniscience, the technology, all of that. And everybody realizes that this is a battle for our lives. So I really think that the ultra-Orthodox, the ones that don't want to fight, I don't know if you saw this picture, the video, of their lining up and there's just like a, like a production line of garments, four-cornered garments, and they're just tying seat seat on seat seat for the soldiers. I did see that, I saw that picture. 
But, you know, just yesterday, Akiva, my 16-year-old son, spent the whole day digging graves. There are literally not enough hands in Israel to dig enough graves for the amount of people that have been murdered. And so Haredim were also out there digging graves. But what's happening is more than that, because Haredim have always taken responsibility for things like digging graves and the rituals, the rituals and the Jewish yeah, right. ceremonies. No, no, no. They are being enlisted to into fight. the Israeli Defense Forces now. And so what we couldn't do on our own, we are being forced to become a unified nation. The same thing is happening for Back the Jewish people. Yeah, the same ahead. thing is happening for Jewish people around the world now. What we weren't able to do together to unite, we are now being forced to unite. And um, the most beautiful video that I've seen so far throughout this entire war is you can't get a flight to Israel right now. It's almost impossible. There are so many Jews from around the world that are flying to Israel to enlist to serve in the army. And when their planes land, all of these teenagers from all around Ben Gurion Airport and maybe from all around Israel have signs in balloons and they're cheering and they're singing, welcoming these heroes home. I think Israel is the only country in the world that when a war breaks out in that country, that people are flying around the world to get back into their own country that is under war. And then you see that there is something so special about the Jewish people, something that is so special about Israel. I have to tell you, Jeremy, I, I can't agree there. with you more. I, as Things happened here last night. I'm not gonna go into the details for security reasons. But it was in t there were some intense moments, at least for me, last night. And, um, and I, I had a thought afterwards. I'm like, okay, with all that's going on, we are actually on the ground wearing our vests with weapons, with uh, ammunition, hopefully enough of ammunition. I, I'd like to have a little bit less because <laughs> we have too much. <laughs> but anyways, um, but you know who my heart really breaks for? It breaks for the Jews uh, in the exile around the world that are feeling absolutely helpless. You know, Shane's nephew just finished the army, just finished the army a week ago. And he got out of the army and he uh, flew to America to visit his parents and spend some time there. And he is just distraught. He is beside himself. How do I get back? I want to get back. What can I do? I haven't been called up to reserves because I haven't been out enough time. What, what do I do? How do I, you know, and there's a lot of that. People are feeling truly, truly distraught. There's a story that I just heard that there was, I don't know the veracity of the story, but it's, I've heard it from a lot of different angles, that there's um, some ultra-Orthodox man, a Haredi man in the airport, and everybody that showed up to the airport with a Tzav Shemona that they were called up to the army, he paid for their tickets, he paid for 250 flights. There's bags and bags and bags and bags of supplies of people that are trying to get weapons here and uh, flashlights and fleeces and whatever. And uh, there's a tremendous uh, awakening happening. And that's what Ruf Cook says, that an awakening happening happens at a time of war. Yeah, time of war, the koach of Mashiach, the power of Mashiach is awoken. Um, so I just want to give a perspective and you know anyone that claims to know prophecy anyone that claims to know real What's going to happen in the end of days? It's there. It's not that they're wrong, but they can't know because the prophecies are obscure for a reason They give room for how Israel responds and how we act. We're in a dance with reality itself but just so you understand, what is the scenario of Gog and Magog? What is the scenario of Armageddon that's painted in the book of Yechezkel? What really happens? There are two superpowers that are at war with each other. Just want to make it clear, Jeremy, when you say Armageddon, I'm not sure that that's a fully Jewish idea. The Meaning, war of Gog the, the and Magog. War, the great war that everyone's, you're the talking war, about the idea of Armageddon, like an all-out war to end wars. That's what you're talking about. I'm talking about the war of Gog and Magog that's mentioned in the prophets of Israel. Right. What is clear is that the Jewish people return to the land of Israel and they live in relative security and prosperity for a while after they return to the land of Israel. After they live in the land of Israel in relative security and prosperity, then something happens. Two superpowers go to war with each other and Israel just happens to be the playing field. It happens to be the battleground where that war takes place. Now, I don't know if you've heard, but there's already one American aircraft carrier that is on the shores practically of Israel. I just now heard that they're sending a second aircraft carrier to the shores of and Israel. And also, Putin has just said that there's a, quote, very high risk of greater powers getting involved right now. And so it seems as though there is an axis between the Hamas Iran, maybe China and Russia, and the Western world, Western civilization, the United States 
and Israel, and these superpowers, you know, it was obvious that the war in the Ukraine was really a battle between America and NATO and Russia, and so that war that's still happening between these forces is now shifting down, and now the new playing ground is Israel. But from the beginning, Israel was never really the center of the battle of Gog and Magog. It was these giant superpowers that are clashing. That is the context. And so when you think about the times that we're living in, the way that I see it is, whether you like it or not, this is our judgment day. This is our judgment day. Whether this is the war of Gog and Magog, a similar war to Gog and Magog, this is our judgment day. And what does that mean? It means everyone is being judged now. How are we responding? How are we taking on responsibility for Israel? What are we doing for Israel? What are we doing to help the Jewish people? What are we doing when we confront this evil? You know, it says, Ohave Hashem sinu ra, those that love God hate evil. It's not enough to just deny the evil or ignore the evil or hide from the evil. We tried. We tried to put up a wall, put up cyber security, cameras, that'll be okay. We'll put some, you know, not even warriors uh, at the borders. We'll put women, tatspitaniot. We'll put women that are looking at cameras. Well, I don't want to tell you what happened to those women that were looking at those cameras at the borders of Gaza. Like, our approach to evil can't be to just watch it and look at it and deny it and hope it won't come. The call is to vanquish the evil, to end it once and for all, never again. Put an end to it at all costs. Over. Done. One by one, kilometer by kilometer, slowly, just end any type of jihad, not only in Gaza, but anywhere in Israel, if we leave this war and there is any jihad that is being spoken about, talked about, funded by the UN in the schools here to continue to perpetuate hatred of Jews, we have lost this war. This is the time now to uproot the evil from its source and just, d d d d what's the word? D destroy, 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 obliterate. It, obliterate it from the face of the earth. This is, the, this is our chance now. Can I share a thought here, Jeremy? So... Um, some people I can hear them saying, but what about, aren't we only supposed to love, conquer worth love? Uh, you know, the, the, the prophets, the Torah tells us, Ohavei Adonai Sinu Ra Shomer Nafshot. The lovers of Hashem hate evil. And Rosh Hashanah said yesterday that hatred of evil can only come from the love of Hashem. Like King David, he was so enraged at the desecration of God's name, of Goliath taunting the armies of the living God of Israel, that that, uh, that caused the hatred of Goliath and the hatred of evil, but it can only come from love. Meaning it has to be rooted in love, built upon love. And, and uh, I'll tell you what I think is, is happening here right now. And this is such a... If there's like one message that I have for what I think is really happening on the deepest spiritual level, it is the, that the nation of Israel is being systematically disabused of all of our idolatry and our illusions. Just like Pharaoh, right? He thought that he was the god of the Nile and then the Nile was filled with blood. And every single one of the plagues was a systematic disabusing of Pharaoh and the Egyptians of their idols and their gods to show that there's one true God. And that's what's happening to us on some level right now. We're being systematically disabused of our idols, one of which the Israeli army, the government of Israel. We had so much faith that they were there, and then it was just a pogrom. Our intelligence, our intelligence, the Mossad, our the technology, our, all of that. <laughs> Gone. Gone. Okay, now we're picking up actual weapons, and we're ready to fight like, with, with knives, sticks, guns, whatever we need to. But that whole thing, <laughs> Gone. Okay, and then we're like, well, uh, America, they've got our back, right? Let's see. Let's see if that actually happens. I'm not so sure because, okay, the, the, yes, the White House is in blue and white, the Champs de or whatever is, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, I don't remember, blue and white. It seemed like the whole world was with Israel. But just wait till our response, any response, and that's gone. Because I have to say it, the world loves dead Jews. Dead Jews. And there's enough dead Jews. And you know what? They're going to put up a, some blue and white on the White House for five minutes. But when that, uh, when Jews are strong and we're defending ourselves, that's not going to happen. So I think we saw what happened with the U.S. and Afghanistan, even if they are our friends. It's in some ways, the current administration in the U.S., we should hope that we're enemies because we see what they do to their friends. Have they abandoned their friends and give money to Iran? So maybe it's best to be not allies of America right now. 
But that idea that the world is with us and what's going to happen is we look to the north, Hezbollah, we look to the south, Hamas, we look to the east, we see Syria and Iran, and then we, we, America's not with us, and there's actually armies converging on us, and we, we literally, there's no chance, according to rational secular thinking, that we should be able to survive the entire world coming against us, or most of the world coming against us without anyone supporting us or defending us. We have no hope in technology and anything, and then we have no choice but from the truest, most visceral, desperate place to say, Hashem, help us! Help us, you're all we have! And then Hashem's going to say, that's just what I've been waiting to hear the entire time. And He will come, and there will be a very magnificent ending to all of this. And the contrast between the peace that our children will experience after this war and the insanity and volatility and insecurity and pain that we experience now, it's like it, we need to be going through this now for that contrast to be so extreme that it pierces our souls and shatters something within us that we are able to say that the tears will flow that the, the, the heart of stone will shatter and the heart of flesh will be right there inside waiting to be revealed. That's what I, that's what I see happening. Oh, I think right now it's time for King David. That's what it feels like. It's time for King David. And what was the difference between Shaul and King David? Saul couldn't finish the job. He didn't kill the king. He left the women. Amalek, he was commanded, get them all. And then they didn't finish the job. And Israel has never, up until now, been able to finish the job. And what did King David write? Velo ashuv ad klotam. I'm going to go after my enemies, and I'm going to destroy them, and I will not return until they are vanquished and gone. And so now this is the time to vanquish the evil and reveal the good. And so that's what I have to say for now. Thank you, Ari. You know, one thing I do want to say, as long as we're just doing this and sending this message out now, because we don't know what tomorrow holds or anything else holds, um, we, need to, we need to be strong right now. And, uh, and so we need to be strong. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful personally that, that you know, uh, for Shana and for my children, I've been able to, when the times matter, to exude uh, strength and positivity and humor. And then in other times, I sort of break down. And, and cry. And uh, if we need to do that, we need to cry. It's real. It's real. And we can cry. Uh, but it should be uh, built on a foundation of strength and faith and conviction that Hashem is with us and He will be with us until the end of this war and far beyond this in Am Yisrael Chai, the nation of Israel lives. Stay strong, my friends. Thank you. <laughs>